new series today. Y'all, y'all, y'all ready for a new series? Amen. Amen. We're going to start a new series today, and it's entitled Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. And I know hearing that, the first thing you think is, why in the world would the pastor want me to be uncomfortable? Why would you want us at all to ever be uncomfortable? Well, I want you to know that being uncomfortable allows you to avoid being complacent and it allows you to get out of your comfort zones. And so if we as Christians begin to live our lives as people that are uncomfortable, then it'll put us in a place where we're ready to see what God is doing in every sphere and every space of our lives. Um, Today, we want to look at confronting, confronting conformity, confronting those things that try to put us in a box and and try to align us with what everybody else is doing. We want to look it dead in the face and say, I'll get uncomfortable because I will not be conformed to what this world is doing. If you have your Bibles with you, if you could turn with me to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter one, Daniel chapter one, and we're going to start in the third verse there and we're going to read through verse 16. Daniel chapter one. Verse three through 16. And if you're able to, wherever you may be, if you're watching this at home or if you're here in the building with us right now, if you could stand on your feet for the reading of the word of God. Praise God for you and praise God for those two feet that work just good for you. You know, sometimes we take certain things for granted, you know, uh, like health. <laughs> we, we, we take for granted the fact that we're supposed to just wake up every morning and, and uh, be in full health. We take for granted uh, that we are able to uh, speak and have our uh, full five senses. And uh, so don't ever take that for granted. So when you get the opportunity, uh, stand up on your feet. When you get the opportunity, uh, shout out in church. Uh, when you get the opportunity, count it as a blessing and make sure that you're not wasting and squandering what you're taking uh, as something that you deserve but it's actually a privilege. We're in first, uh, we're in Daniel chapter one, starting with the third verse. And it reads, then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Now, let me um, bring some context to this right now. What's going on is that the kingdom of Judah has been uh, brought into captivity um, by the Babylonian Empire. They have taken them and uh, they've taken them away into exile. And right now what they're doing is selecting people from uh, the Israelites that have been brought captive and uh, using them, training them up to put them into the king's service. And so uh, verse verse four, the second part of it says he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those that were chosen from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Somebody say 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this 
and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Before you have your seat, I want you to look at somebody and I want you to look at them dead in their eyes and say, I'm about to get uncomfortable. <laughs> you may have your seats in the presence of God. It's amazing how eye contact sometimes can, can bring about a feeling of uncomfortableness, right? <laughs> Just eye contact sometimes. You know, growing up, as we begin to develop in our lives and we begin to grow, we, we get these value systems that are put in place, right? And we begin to set certain habits and, and we begin to acknowledge certain social norms, and we begin to get an understanding as we grow of what comfort looks like. You know, if you're fortunate to have some stability in your life, you can develop a lifestyle that allows you to get into a rhythm, allows you to get into a day-to-day -day process, and you begin to live what people call a normal, everyday life, right? And you get to do those things, and many people, that is what they consider to be comfortable. Living a normal everyday life where they just go to work and come home and spend time with their family, eat a meal and then go to sleep and then do it all over again. And that's what a lot of people consider comfortable. They get used to a certain way of life and comfort. While it can be a good thing, the problem is comfort can work both ways. People can get comfortable in living a good life and going about what they're used to. But comfort has this sneaky trait where it can make you reside and live in a place where it's not all good around you, but because you're used to it, you'll stick around in it because it's comfortable. How many bad relationships have you observed or been in where things aren't going good? They've been going bad for a really long time, but because you're comfortable, you continue in those things. You got friends that you knew you should have cut off years ago, but because we go back and we know each other and it's comfortable, you stay in negative friendships because you're comfortable in them. I was reading this story about this elephant that they had from birth, right? And this elephant, what they did was they tied it up to a tree, not with a chain, but with a rope. And that's cruel and inhumane and they probably should have called Peter on them for doing that. But there was just an experiment. So they had this elephant and they had him tied to this rope and they had him tied to this, uh, this, this small little tree, right? And so uh, it wasn't a big grand oak tree. It was just a small tree. And so the elephant was tied to it. And as a young elephant, it wanted to roam. It didn't want to be stuck to this tree. And so it would run and the tree would bend a little bit, but he could never break the tree to get out of it. And he tried for every day to run and then that rope would just snatch him back, right? And the tree would bend, but it would just snap him right back because he was too small to break it. Well, after a while, this elephant stopped trying to run away because he realized that, you know, if I try to run, the tree's going to pull me back. But this elephant did not stop growing. The elephant continued to get bigger and bigger and bigger until the point where it could have poured that tree out from the roots. And it was still tied with that same small rope. But at the very end of the day, the elephant got comfortable with the fact that it could not break away. And even when it was three, four times the size it was to begin with, it could have easily broken down the barriers that held it in. It stayed put because it was comfortable with its surroundings. How often do we find ourselves as Christians with the ability and power to break through a situation that has us bound? But forgetting the God that we serve is saying, well, I guess I'll just stay right here. God, God brought me this far, so I guess this is only as far as he meant for me to go. Uh, maybe this is the end of the road for me. Maybe this is where I should stop. Well, I don't want us to get to a place as children of God where we are comfortable with just a little bit that is in front of us. There was so much meat left on the bone and there was so much more for us to do as children of God that we can't be stuck in these comfort zones that we can't place ourselves in these areas where we're stuck when we have no business being stuck there. 
We can, and no, no matter what's going on around us, we can't get to a point where we're, where we're not only complacent, but we're in the point where we're, we're conforming to what's going on around us, getting used to and, and setting ourselves in this lifestyle and in this box when we have no business at all being there, conforming to what's around us. If we get too comfortable and we get too complacent, then we will never realize the full potential that God has available for our lives. Whether you're in a good place or you're in a bad place, don't get comfortable there. The one thing that you can count on and then one thing that 2020's probably taught each and every one of us is that change is guaranteed to come. That there will be something that you did not expect that comes your way. And the absolute worst thing you can do in times like this is be resistant to change is be resistant to the fact that you can move, that you don't have to get in this place and stay comfortable, that, that you can move around and, and, and get uncomfortable. Look at somebody and say, I'm getting uncomfortable. I'm getting uncomfortable. That is what we're doing this year. Many times people will just try to encourage us to conform to whatever the world is doing at any given time. You know, should, should we be Doing what everyone else is doing, should that be what our focus is? is, is that be, should that be what we desire to do? I'm here to let you know that as Christians, we're called to be a, a peculiar people. That, that we shouldn't look exactly like everyone else looks. And we shouldn't conform to the norms that everybody says that we should do. Just because it sounds cool on social media and because the whole timeline is saying it should be one way. That doesn't mean that we have to conform to that. In fact, my Bible says in Romans 12 and 2 to not conform. Do not conform to the ways of this world. Don't do that. You, you are transformed and you renew your mind daily with what God has given you. But do not be conformed to the, to the ways of this world. And we have a job and, 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 a, and a firm commitment that we need to do what God is calling us to do above anything that the world has told us is the norm. Is that the, what the world has told us we should be comfortable with, what we should accept. We need to be those people that make it uncomfortable. Our scripture tells us about the account of Daniel, right? And, and this takes place, like I said, the Babylonian Empire had, had come in to the kingdom of Judah and they basically strong-armed them. They tore down the city. God had told them many, many times in Judah to get right. You saw what happened to the other kingdom in Israel, in northern Israel, and you are next if you don't get right. And God gave him many, many warnings, and then finally he said, okay, I'm going to re release my heads of protection, and the, you're going to get taken over. And so the Babylonians came in, and as the Babylonians came in, uh, they uh, began to murder a lot of people. They began to take a lot of people that they felt had any value. They said, we'll take the people of value. And we'll even leave the poor people here so they can tend to this land that we've taken over. And so they had a complete and total overhaul of what was going on in Judah. And the kingdom of Judah, the bad thing is that they, they began to shift away from God before any of this had ever happened. And when God removed his protection and allowed the Babylonians to come in, they realized how inadequate they really were. They, they, they got to see firsthand exactly how much power they really had. And before we go any further, it's interesting to see that when God removes his protection, when God removes his hand from things, how far things can go into disarray. How things we thought we had under control, how things we thought we knew how it was operating good and we thought we were living high and flying above the radar. And God comes in and says, you know, without me, experience what you experience. Let that happen without me. And, and this is exactly what we see happening. Things get uncomfortable real quick when God removes his hand from, from, from what we're going through. Things begin to get uncomfortable real quick. And so, so the king of Babylon, that was Nebuchadnezzar. You may have heard his name in a few other stories in the Bible. He decides to utilize some of the young talent from those people that he got out of Judah. He says he's young, these wise, these, these strong, good looking men that are able to be of service to me. What I'm going to do is as I conquer this kingdom, I'm going to bring them in. I'm going to take the best and I'm going to take the brightest. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach them our language. I'm going to teach them our way of living. And eventually I'm going to assimilate them to become almost Babylonian. <laughs> they're almost going to be one of us, essentially. They may have been born somewhere else, but they're strong and we're going to use them in the service for the kingdom. And so his entire goal with taking people like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and other Hebrews was to take these strong people and assimilate them 
into the lifestyle of uh, the, the, the king, of the, the royalty in Babylon. And, and thinking about that, if you think about it from the surface level, you might say, well, isn't that a good thing for Daniel? His whole city has been torn down. His loved ones have been uh, hoisted off to somewhere that they, they never have been before. And God's hand is away from everybody. But you have to remember that going into that service, into the kingdom and being assimilated, made to be something that you're not. That's a really uncomfortable situation. <laughs> that is a really uncomfortable situation. If somebody took you uh, from here, you are an American citizen and somebody takes you somewhere uh, over in Hong Kong and says, you're going to come here and you're going to assimilate and you're going to talk like them. You're going to learn that language, which is very difficult to learn. You're going to uh, live in this place. You're going to find a job and you're going to shift from uh, a democracy to communism and you're just going to do all those things and they just uproot you and put you there. Even if they paid for it, that'd be pretty difficult, right? <laughs> Even if they covered the expenses and they did everything for you and they gave you the benefits of it, at the end of the day, that is an uncomfortable situation to find yourself in. He was in a foreign, Daniel himself, he was moved to a foreign land with foreign practices and all these things and not all of them aligned with God's law. Not everything that they were doing over there aligned with the law and the customs that God had presented to his people through Moses. And so the king's goal, his entire goal for Daniel and the other Hebrew boys is really to forget where they came from. He wanted them to forget where they came from and, and assimilate to the Babylonian lifestyle, the customs, the beliefs. He wanted them to believe in him more than they believed in anything else. And so much so that when they came over, the first thing he did was change their names. He said, hey, you, you're not Daniel no more. You, you Belteshazzar. And, and he gave them names. These names were very specific. The names he was giving them, these were names that were honoring the gods of the Babylonians. So he said, you went from a, a, a Hebrew uh, somebody who had a name that, that meant uh, that was worshiping Yahweh. Well, I'm going to give you a name that worships our God so that you're not even thinking about even when they say your name, you're not speaking who you used to be. And so the king's goal was to, to, to make them forget about all those things that they had been through. And after he changed their name, they began to implement smaller things in as well, like a dietary change. He says, not only is your name going to change, but you're going to eat this food that was reserved for the royals. You're going to eat this food and, and I'm not worried about anything else that you used to do. This food that I have reserved for you right now is going to make you stronger and get you fit for this work in this kingdom. And I know the food that they were giving them was top notch food. This was food from the royal palace. This was food from the king's table. This was really good food that he was offering to them. But the problem came in because that food that he was giving them did not align with the law of Moses that determined what foods were clean and what foods were unclean. And the law of Moses that he gave to the Israelites for that time, there were certain animals that they weren't allowed to eat. There were, there were certain things that they weren't allowed to consume. There were certain things that they weren't allowed to do. And you might think, OK, well, that's kind of a, a, a minute point, Daniel. Really? This is the battle you want to pick? <laughs> they changed your whole name and you, you really the, the battle you want to pick is about what to eat. You know, this is the small thing you're going to do. And Daniel was smart enough to realize that it would not end at the food. <laughs> this wasn't going to be the end all be all. You, you want me to break uh, my, my, my religious beliefs and you want me to stop um, on this small thing. But we know that small thing, because he knew they were trying to assimilate him into that land and into them customs and beliefs, that that small thing would eventually grow into something way bigger. That, that it would start with just the food, but, but then it would lead into something like, okay, well, I need a little bit more of your time. Uh, you can't spend that time praying because we need you here. Uh, oh, you can't spend that time talking to your God. I need you to do this. Oh, you can't spend that time worshiping. In fact, uh, you shouldn't be worshiping that at all. You should be worshiping this statue that I have before you. And small things begin to lead into big things. So Daniel saw from the beginning, from the wisdom given to him by God, that it wasn't just about the food. It was about the principle. They were doing their best to indoctrinate Daniel and make him live a completely different lifestyle than he had lived before. And so while it couldn't have been easy for Daniel to come to his senses and say, 
just because I'm abiding in this new place in Babylon, just because I'm in your land, I want to live out correctly how God established for us to live beforehand. And going to the king's servant and making this request, saying, can I not eat that food for just, 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 I, I don't want to defile myself. I don't want to go against what God has created me to be and created me to do. Can I? And he went to him with the right attitude. And, and while it may have been so much easier for him to just conform and just be comfortable with what they were eating, what they were doing, what they were trying to have him do, why, it would have been so much easier for him to just be like, you know what, um, I'm just going to eat this. This is only a small thing. It's only food. Y'all, y'all know if you ever look at the Old Testament that the law of Moses isn't just one page. It's a long document, right? And he could have just been like, well, this is just this one thing. I, 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 you know, this is what everybody else is eating. This is what everybody else is doing. I would be, I just do this one thing. It would have been so easy for him to be comfortable and conform to that. But the problem today is that if we allow that one small thing to just enter in and be like, well, I, I do good. I, I'm doing good everywhere else. Just this one thing, you know. I'll just, I'll just be comfortable in that. Then I promise you that it will not remain that one thing. That it will spread into other areas of your life. It'll begin to contaminate the things that are clean around it. That it'll begin to get in the way of your relationship if you allow that one thing, just that one thing, to persist and that you get comfortable in it. That's why we're getting uncomfortable today. Say, I'm uncomfortable today. I know that there are certain things that we can look at and and we can say, how can I put that into practice in my own life so that I can avoid conforming to the standards of the world? And the first thing that we should pay attention to is that we should not allow our environment to dictate our integrity. Don't allow what's going on around you to determine your behavior, to determine how you respect the, the, the things that God has told you to do in your life. It's so easy to get comfortable in our environment and let that dictate our morality, let that dictate our integrity, let whatever the world says be, uh, you know, the end all beat all. In, in, this, in this day and age, you know, we have what's called cancel culture, you know? And so if you don't agree completely with what the majority of people say, then the first thing they try to do is get rid of you. They say you shouldn't have a job. You shouldn't be able to speak. They should cancel everything that you got going on in your life because you don't agree with us on a certain subject. Isn't it amazing to think that people have become so judgmental that they leave no room for grace, that they say if you're not doing what we agree with, if you're not conforming to how we think, then we need to get rid of you and cancel you completely. But as the children of God, we are required to live according to the standard of God's word. We are required according, to live according to what God has called us to do. Not what the world is saying, we can cancel you over, or not what the world is saying, oh, that makes us uncomfortable so you can't say, or that makes us not feel good. We, as, as children of God, are responsible for stepping in and saying, I don't have to be conformed to what you got going on right here. I don't have to be in this box that you're trying to place me in. I don't have to stay with what the world says is okay because the word of God is a never changing document. And I promise you, if you live by that, there's nothing the world can do to take you down. Just because everyone is popularizing something, just because the, the world has made it seem like that's the right thing to do. If it's contrary to the word of God, you do not and are not obligated to take that same stance. You don't have to. Just, just because the, the, the world may threaten you, it may make you feel uncomfortable to step out and say, uh, you know, I just, that's not what I agree with. The, the word of God, it's not, and it's not based on my thoughts and opinions, it's based on what the word of God says. And sometimes it's going to require you to step out and be uncomfortable in a setting where everybody is trying to make you conform. I just want you to know today that it's okay because as Christians, we're called to not conform. We're called to be uncomfortable in these situations, to move in in an attitude that doesn't conform to everything that you see going on around you. See, when when Daniel and the other boys were were taken from their homes, uh, they were being trained to work for the king and trained to to be exactly what the king wanted them to be. And and it it would have been almost a no-brainer to follow all those instructions. To say, I don't care what I got going on. 
I've been taken from my home. This is the only person that has my life in their hands right now. I'm going to follow everything they tell me to do. Yet and still, Daniel knew that eating that food went directly against the word of God. These are people, they had his life in, his, in their hands. Instead of just saying, well, I'm going to eat this food and, and God knows my heart. <laughs> or I'm going to do this and, and God is going to, you know, he'll forgive me later for it anyway. God, he said, I'm not going to sin against God and defile myself. I'm not going to just so everybody else can feel comfortable and everybody else can feel good. If my life is on the line, my dying wish and my dying action will be following the will of God. The last, if that's the last thing I do, it'll be following God. And so Daniel decides to get uncomfortable and make that request. He says, I'm going to step out and I'm going to make this request. And I'm going to ask, can I not eat this food that's not clean? And so he goes to the king's assistant. And he doesn't go in defiance. He doesn't go with his chest puffed out saying, I ain't going to eat this food. You got, you're going to have to make me. You're going to have to shove it down my throat if you want me to eat this food. He doesn't come with an attitude. He comes with a humble request saying, this is not going to work for me. He said, instead of you giving me the bacon and, and the ham and the pork chops and the pig's feet and the hog maws and all of that, I just want some fruits and veggies. I, 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 that's all I want to eat. And the problem is he didn't let the temptation, the good thing is he didn't let the temptation of that food, of that unclean food, he didn't let that interfere with the fact that he had integrity. Interfere with the fact that even if nobody else around was to call him out and say, aren't you a Hebrew? What you doing eating? No, even it didn't matter what was going on around him. He said, my integrity says I can't do that. My, my, my morality in the word of God says I shouldn't do that. So because it says that, I'm going to abide by it. And he took the chance. Like I said, he didn't go in defiance. He went and made that request. And even though when, 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 God, when people may not notice, when we honor God in the things that we do, he takes notice. If nobody else at that table knew that, that Daniel was doing what he did, he was still honoring God. And I promise you that God took notice to that. God definitely took notice that. And even if you don't deserve it, God provides his grace and God provides his favor so that you can accomplish whatever goal that he has set for you. So that you can accomplish whatever instruction that he gives to you. God provides a way. God makes a way. You know why I, you know how I know that? Because when Daniel made that request, the, the, the king's servant didn't just shoot him down immediately. He entertained it. He said he, he, he had a dialogue with him. Now, anybody else... You talk to the king's servant that way, he, he just tell you, no, get, get back over there. What are you doing? I'm here to train you up. What are you, you trying to uh, go against my instructions? He had a dialogue with him. He said, now, Daniel, you know that the king will have my head if, if, if I let you get weaker in front of everybody. But God had given him favor to the point where he said, all right, just give me 10 days. 10 days. Me, me and my Hebrew bros, give us 10 days and watch what happens. And because the favor of God was on Daniel, he allowed the, the, the event to take place right there where Daniel could exercise his belief and show his faith to those that were surrounding. God made a way and, and gave him an opportunity to exercise his faith and gave his favor to him so that he could accomplish what God instructed him to do. And I just want you guys to know today that if God has given you instruction, everything that is in his word is true. And he's not going to give you instruction if he's not going to make a way for you to do that. He is a way maker. So even if it seems impossible to accomplish something, God, how do you expect me to be a giver when I ain't got a dollar to my name? God, how is it that, that you expect me to love someone that has treated me so badly? God, how can you request that I do these things? And make it so difficult. Well, he will not give you instruction without giving you a pathway. He will not give you uh, these things to do and then laugh at you because you can't accomplish it. God, God provided a way so that he was in the midst of that. And I, I've seen stories about people that, that grow up in these strict homes and, uh, you know, they have parents to stay on top of them, make sure their kids are always in the books and they... Uh, you know, are always studying and they may not allot them much time to have social uh, social life because they're so hard on them in studying. 
And they may do good at that time. And they may be good in that environment. You know, they may accomplish a lot because that's what they become comfortable to. But the issue comes in when they get sent off to college and they no longer have that parent staying on top of them and keeping them in that same vein of dedication in their work. And because they're out of their comfort zone, because they they're, they're no longer have the parents to keep them uh, bare down in their workload, then all of a sudden they get to school and they begin to do terrible in their studies and they flunk classes, their studies, not because they didn't have the ability, but because they got into a situation where they neglected what they knew. They were no longer under the watchful eye of their parents. They were no longer held to the same level of accountability. And today, we have to make sure that even if we're outside of these walls, even if we're around a different set of friends, even if we're around somebody that isn't steadily nagging us and telling us what we should be doing, that our integrity says, I won't defile myself. I won't conform to what's going on here, regardless of who's around. I'm going to stick with the same thing I had beforehand that, that carried me this far. I'm going to still be loyal to the God who's brought me a mighty long way. I don't care if my environment changes. I don't care if my leadership changes. I don't care if my people around me change. At the very end of the day, my integrity will not be shifted because I am a firm believer and have faith in what God has called me to do. Daniel would have never known that the king's assistant would give him an opportunity to pursue this alternate diet and to pursue this alternate way of eating if he did not ask. <laughs> if he had just said, you know what? Uh, this king's, I mean, he's going to just turn me down anyway. Uh, I don't want to have that uncomfortable conversation just to make it awkward in between us. And all he's going to do is say no. He's just going to say no anyway. How often do we find ourselves where we don't even ask the question? We don't even want to go to God and make our request known boldly because, oh, God doesn't, God, he may not even do it for us anyway. He may not even bring this up out in my life anyway. Why should I ask? Why should I do that? Well, I'm challenging you to get uncomfortable in your prayer life. Stretch yourself a little bit. Get to a place where you say, God, I know that you're a God that does exceedingly abundantly above anything I can ever ask or think about because of that power that's working in me right now. And so we got to get to a point where we say, I'll get uncomfortable with my prayer life. I I'll get uncomfortable with my praise. If you see me with my hands raised and it's not running down my face and getting to a point where everybody's staring at me, I'm okay because I'm getting uncomfortable. I'm stretching in my faith. We can't get to a point where we're just complacent, where we come here every Sunday and we just say, hallelujah. And that's the end of it. We come here to have an encounter and we come here to experience what God has for us. So what we cannot do as a people is allow our environment, wherever we are, to dictate our integrity, to dictate our level of faith and to dictate the way that we are. Today, we have to refrain from getting to a point where we allow the things and distractions that are in front of us to prevent us from moving forth in faith as God has called us to do. The next thing that we should do is be mindful of what we digest. Be mindful of what you digest. See, Daniel not only exercised this from a physical standpoint, but also from a spiritual standpoint. Because the, the king's goal, like I said, was to make them assimilate, was to make them become Babylonian, essentially. He wanted to use them for his good and, and service in the kingdom. So he wanted them to throw their own culture out throw everything you knew before, including your name, out the window and join us and become who we want you to be. And it was more than about just the food. It, it was more their whole mindset that the king wanted. He didn't just want their bellies. He wanted their minds. He wanted them to behave exactly like he wanted them to behave. But the beautiful thing about Daniel is you can take the boy out the temple, <laughs> but you can't take the temple out the boy. <laughs> you, can, you can move him from his old home and, and from the, the people that he used to be around. But when you got the fire of the Holy Ghost dwelling inside of you, you can be in Maine, you can be in Spain, you can be here, you can be there. I'm preaching like Dr. Seuss today. Wherever you may be, the Holy Spirit will be there with you. 
And so you can maintain your spiritual appetite for the things that need to be there. And so he, he, Daniel was so devoted that he didn't just allow any food or any ideology to come into his body and into his mind. He didn't just allow anything to make its way into. And we have to be very careful that on a spiritual level that our digestion is right. Okay. That the things that we're taking in is right. He didn't just take on the worship of the gods of Babylon just because they were nearby and they were in close proximity. He didn't say, well, I was worshiping God and we were in the temple in, in Jerusalem. And so I worship God there, but I'm here now and, and they got Baal. So I can I can worship Baal and I can worship all the other gods that are around. Instead, Daniel was not content on digesting it just because it was available, just because it was close by. <laughs> that wasn't his motivation. He, Daniel was only content to digest food that was acceptable to God in the physical, and he was only there to accept taking in God's word, which is the bread of life, and that was what he was taking into his mind. And so Daniel didn't just allow everything to come in. That's not what he allowed to do. He wasn't going to let sin, sinning against God become his norm. He wasn't going to begin to accept that and, and just digest that in his life. He wasn't going to accept everything that came in around him. And I know some of us wouldn't want to rock the boat. Some of us don't want to don't want to make things awkward around the world and, and, and turn things down. Have anybody ever done this foolish thing, gone to your grandma's house after she prepared a meal? And you stopped at McDonald's before you got there and you ate and she had a meal for you and you came in and you had to say, I, I don't want that. <laughs> I, I'm full already. You have to understand that you can't just dine on everything that is around you. You can't just take in what's easy around you. Yes, yeah, easy to get a burger instead of going to be impatient and waiting for what granny has for you. But it's more important that we digest the correct thing, not just the convenient thing. It's more important that we take in what's designed by God for us to take in instead of this mess and filth that the world will try to offer you. Yeah, it may be easier to consume, <laughs> but is it better for you to consume? Maybe it looks more appealing for you to assume, consume. Because I'll be honest, I like pork. <laughs> I, I like bacon. I, I, I eat bacon. You know, I enjoy bacon. But as Daniel looked at the spread that was in front of him, this food that was considered unclean, that was it easier for him to say, I'm going to just eat these fruits and vegetables and, and ignore the, the, the food that's being offered to me that came from the king's table just so that I can remain uh, true to these laws that are, you know, not even really applicable in this land to the people who don't care nothing about it in this land. So, he had to have that uncomfortable conversation. He had to have a, a, a heart to heart and say that I'm not going to take in those things. Some of us need to have some uncomfortable conversations in our life right now. We need to have some uncomfortable conversations with some people and say, I know, I know your intentions are good, but, but I can't eat this every day. I can't eat this gossip that you're feeding me every single day. I, I can't eat this slander that you're feeding me every day. I can't get on the television and, 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 and watch this stuff and feed myself with this negative images all day long. I can't feed myself on CNN and Fox News every day. I can't feed myself on these things that don't amount to anything. I got to change my digestive system. I have to eat and live on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's what I feed on. That's what I digest every day. That's what I'm making sure is constantly playing in my mind. I get full off of those things because if I digest too much junk food, then I'm going to have high cholesterol, I'm going to have diabetes. Uh, 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 it's going to lead to a slow death. Leads to a slow death. That's why it's so important that we monitor what we take in and what we digest. Daniel had to look and say, I'm not digesting this food and I'm not digesting this ideology. Because I realized that while it may seem small right now, food, you know, 10 days, this, this food in front of me, I'm making an issue out of this because I realized that these become long-term issues that lead to a slow death. So I have to restrict some things. If I want to survive longer, I got to restrict some things. If I want to live a healthy spiritual life, I got to say that I can't digest certain things. Certain things, I can't spend too much time there. I, I need to be living on God's word. And, and, and the thing about when we do 
experience, you know, a little bit of junk food or we get, you know, a little bit of something that we probably shouldn't eat a bunch of, we can develop an appetite for it. You can develop an appetite for it. You ever caught yourself? You, you may have never eaten at a restaurant before and you get a meal from that place and you're like, oh man, the hype really lived up. Like, this is some good food right here. And then all of a sudden, this place you had never heard of before, all of a sudden, a week later, you're like, ooh, I could really go for that restaurant right now. <laughs> I could really go for some of that right now. Because you can develop an appetite for something that you've never had before when you digest it, when you take it in. You can develop an appetite for that. So I'm warning you, I'm, I'm, I'm praying today for you that you would just be mindful of the things that you're taking in. Always be mindful of what you take in physically, because, I mean, we got to protect our temples, our bodies. But spiritually, be mindful of the things you're taking in. Just as Daniel said, I'm not going to conform to what you're eating. I'm not, I'm not just going to digest what you put in front of me. I'm, I'll be uncomfortable. And if I got to eat fruits and vegetables while you're eating uh, steaks and, and gourmet meals in front of me, I, I'll be okay. Because I would rather be uncomfortable than to be opposed to the word of God. And the, the culmination of what you consume, it results in your energy. It results in your strength. And that's what the body uses. So remember this final point that true strength is built in devotion to God. Your strength will be built up based on the time that you're spending with God and understanding the fullness of what he's able to do. It's pretty clear that after Daniel and the other Hebrew boys ate clean for those 10 days and they did those things that uh, the, the other servants had, had gorged on that food and all that fatty food that was bad for them. And then Daniel and the, his boys came out after those 10 days looking better than those other men that had ate the food that was on the king's table. So they glowed. They, they, uh, there was one translation that said they were fatter. <laughs> Can you imagine? They had fruits and vegetables and the other men ate meat and, and what people, you know, uh, think will make you big and strong and buffed up in protein. And the scripture said that they were fatter because they ate the correct way. See, but they, they would never come to that realization that they would be bigger in stature if they had not decided to be reverent to the God of Israel. They had not decided to say, I'm going to honor God. I'm going to have devotion to God. I'm going to do what he's called me to do, uh, uh, even though it's more tempting to do what's in front of me right now. So the, the Bible says that the Hebrew boys look healthier and more nourished. And, and the fact that they look fatter based off of what they took in was a sign that if you've ever looked, that it, it, if, would you imagine somebody who is skinnier and you would imagine somebody who would be almost frail and, and, and not have much left to them if you had these men that were eating these big giant spreads and then you had these dudes that are over there with just some grain, <laughs> maybe some fruit with them. You would imagine that at the end of 10 days that they would be so much smaller. That they would be the ones that, that uh, were looked at upon as weaker. That they would be the ones that you would look at and say, how is it possible that, that they're about to be servants for the king the way they look over there scrawny and whatnot? But instead, God began to work through that life. When you dedicate your life to Christ and you begin to follow his ways, you'll receive strength that won't make sense to the world. You'll begin to receive strength that to the natural eye wouldn't make sense for you to have. You, you have the peace that surpasses all understanding. When it's chaos all around you and everything around you seems to be in disarray, people will look at you and say, how is it that you're pressing through? I would be crushed under the weight of that turmoil. I would be downtrodden if I saw that. But because of your devotion, because of what you were doing in your prayer closet, because of what you were doing when you were lifting up your hands in praise, because of your devotion to what God has called you to do, you got strength that they have no idea where it came from. They're lost and confused about it. They say, how is it that you have that strength? The world would have to believe, would have you believe that 
that money should be over everything, right? That money is where you devise your strength from. That money is what gives you the power. And it's interesting because the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. The thing that the world is telling you need to put first, and that's what's going to give you power. That's what's going to give you strength. The Bible says loving that thing is where evil begins. That they would have you believe that, that you get your strength from, from acquiring power and having a claim and, and having fame. But the Bible says that, that God opposes the proud. <laughs> and and, and that, that he, he loves those that are, that are humble. He exalts those that are humble and lifts those people up. So contrary to what the world thinks should be happening, the, while the world thinks you should be shrinking, while the world thinks you should be losing, you're actually gaining and you're actually putting on muscle and you're putting on weight and you're getting strengthened by God who says, I can do things that are counterintuitive to the, what the world's got going on. I, I can bring love where there's only hate. I can bring peace where there's only turmoil, where there's only chaos. I can bring my spirit to calm down the waves. That's the God that we serve. God will provide things we need. God will give us exactly what we need for our true strength. He'll put into place exactly what we need so that we can have peace when we're being attacked. He has the hands of mercy to carry us through those experiences of shame. He has the hands of grace to give you exactly what you don't deserve. That's the God that we serve. Only he can build you up with that true strength. And while the world may think you get it one way, and while the world may think you need to eat this food, you need to digest this. This is what's going to make you strong. You're going to look up in those 10 days over and you'll be stronger than they ever could have imagined being on that diet of those things of the world. When we started this building project, I had absolutely no idea how strong God would build my faith up to be through this process. I really was, you know, stepping out on faith and, and believing that God would work things out for our good. And so when we started this project, we, we honestly didn't have all the resources. We didn't have the know-how. We didn't have the people. Yet when we devoted ourselves to God and said, God, this is you that, that, that is in charge of this. You are the one that can set subcontractors in place. You are the one that provides every single dollar that flows through this place. You are the one that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever think or imagine. And this is bigger than I imagined already. And it's because we devoted it to God. We said, God, on our own, it'll never be worth anything. It'll never make it to anywhere, but he'll give you the strength to make it in every uh, wrong thing that goes, every bad thing that happens, every good thing that happens. No matter the circumstance, he'll give you the strength to persevere through it and see it through to what he has planned for it. And no, it's not done yet. <laughs> well, it's not over yet. But because of the strength that was developed, because of what the, the faith that he built up in us early, we can keep pressing through. This story, well, as you saw, we're in Daniel 1. So it doesn't end with just them having the victory over the friend. This was a building block so that faith could be strengthened so when greater circumstances came about, and it happened in Daniel's life and the other Hebrew boys' lives, that bigger and more life-threatening situations took place that they had already built their faith up starting from the table starting from the, the small things. After the 10 days were over, the Hebrew boys and Daniel looked so much better than the other men that the, king, the, uh, the king's servant said, we all going on that diet. <laughs> I don't know what was in that grain, but y'all all getting some of that today. And we're getting rid of everything else, right? And so because of them stepping out in faith, because of them saying, I would rather honor God than defile myself, because God's word is still true, and whether we're in here or, or whether we're in a faraway land, I, I'm still going to abide by what he said. Because they made that decision, their actions 
impacted everybody who was there. I want y'all to know today that our actions will impact people directly, don't impact people indirectly when we seek to do the will of God in our lives. In all situations, saying, I'm not going to conform to the world standard of doing this thing. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to everybody around, but at the very end of the day, I'm going to be uncomfortable for Christ because what he'll do is allow my impact to be shown greater than myself. Yeah, it started with me making a decision in my own life. I made the decision to say I will abide by what God's word is telling me to do. And it led to everyone around being affected by his decision to say yes to the will of God of God. It may seem easier today to just say and make excuses about why we have to do what the world is saying we have to we should do. Why we have no other option but to do what the world is saying that we should be doing. But I guarantee you today that God's direction will benefit you more in the end than just conceding to the conformities of this world. So I want us all today to take steps to confront conformity. To say, I no longer will just fit into this box. I will be uncomfortable. Say it one more time. I'm uncomfortable today. today. And we want to get to a point as children of God that we will not step into this box and be stuck and placed in this uh, place where we have no option but to follow the what people say we should be doing. The word of God is your God. Pray about it. Seek him. And even if the people around you make you feel uncomfortable, there's nothing better than being in relationship with your father. Let's go ahead and move into prayer. Father God, we thank you today for your loving kindness. We thank you for being a God that is concerned about our affairs. And Lord, we are grateful today because you have allowed us a space that even when things around us seem uncomfortable, that you are making a way for us. And so we ask that you would lead us and guide us today and give us strength even when the world opposes us. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. And right now, before we end this time together, I want to give you an opportunity to Make one of the greatest decisions that you could ever make in your life. To accept Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He's the God that can help you when you're in these uncomfortable situations. But he's the God that can give you peace. And most importantly, he is the God that can give you life. Every person was born into this world into sin. But... God gave us the sin solution through Christ Jesus. So today, if you say, I want to accept the free gift of salvation so that I may know where my eternal residence will be, today will be a great day to accept Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So if you're watching this, wherever you may be, If you want to accept Christ Jesus, we're going to all pray this prayer together for the benefit of those that are accepting Christ for the first time. And I just want you to repeat this prayer, say it with conviction, mean it in your heart so that a change could come to your household. Just repeat this. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I thank you for dying for my sins. And I believe you rose from the grave. grave. Today I make you my Lord. Lord. And I make you my Savior. Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. pray. Amen.